Hey everybody, this is Scott Arnell and welcome to this episode of the SRI 360 podcast where in every episode I interview world-class, sustainable and responsible investors, executives or entrepreneurs who are driving positive change in the world while achieving market returns. And I do this in order to bring you the lessons that they've learned along the way from their investment activities and their experiences and to find out what they are actually doing and how they are doing it so that you can have better insights into the different SRI investing strategies that are actually being done today and what they're actually doing right now and doing it across many different asset classes. And hopefully this will help you invest in a more purposeful way and to invest for positive impact for a better world through your investment activities. Now today I'm speaking with Ben Rick and that's spelled like it sounds R-I-C-K. And Ben is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Social and Sustainable Capital or SASC as Ben often refers to it in our discussion. And SASC is based in London and that's in England of course. Social and Sustainable Capital is a company that provides flexible capital to enable social Social sector organizations grow their social impact, tackle society's most pressing challenges, and improve the lives of disadvantaged people across the United Kingdom. Ben grew up in London and studied at UMIST in Manchester, which is short for the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, graduating with a Bachelor of Science First Class Honors degree in Management Science. He joined Goldman Sachs in the Treasury Department in 1993 before moving to the corporate bond trading desks at Lehman Brothers and then later on at UBS, where he jointly ran the corporate bond trading department. In 2002, Ben moved to the buy side, working initially at credit hedge fund Green Tea Asset Management as a portfolio manager. And then he went on to Merrill Lynch, where over a seven year period, he built a highly successful bond trading business and became the managing director responsible for the EMEA or Europe, Middle East and Africa arm of what became the Bank of America Merrill Lynch Global Proprietary Trading Group. Ben is a very unusual person in that after making a move to become a partner at hedge fund BTG Pactual, during which time he found his environment increasingly distasteful in a number of ways and incompatible with his internal values, he made the unusual decision to leave his city career behind and launch his career in a different direction focused on social investing. This discussion today was very impactful to me because personally, I'm not able to recall anyone that I know who was succeeding at Ben's level in this type of environment who decided that his bag was full enough and had the personal courage to do this. And in today's episode, you will hear very unique stories about how Ben creatively followed his voice within, completely reinvented himself, and has subsequently made an enormous difference in countless people's lives. In our far-reaching conversation today, we will discuss Ben's early career where he quickly adapted to the adrenaline-filled life of the corporate bond trading room in some of the largest bond trading departments of the time, how he called it quits and founded Social and Sustainable Capital, how he developed a unique business model of raising a social investment property fund specifically designed to on-lend to not-for-profit companies and charities to buy real estate properties that house disadvantaged people, people who are homeless, women and children who are victims of domestic violence, asylum seekers, and housing for people requiring mental health care who are under the care of the local and central UK governments. He details how his fund provides a unique equity position to the borrowers, no matter what the market does, and the returns and risks to his investors. And we discuss how he manages the natural tension between delivering financial returns to investors while deploying capital to companies that have real, urgent human needs. And we talk about a whole lot more along the way. This conversation with Ben was super interesting for me, full of personal insights, and I think you will enjoy listening too. And now, please meet Ben Rick. So I would describe myself as being the founder and CEO of a social investment organization which aims to bring the skills and rigor developed in the you know career in mainstream finance to the amazing and inspiring world of charities and social enterprises where we are trying to do our bit to help amazing social entrepreneurs and amazing organizations be the best they can be so that they can help those disadvantaged or vulnerable as they cope with modern day society. Sounds like you got a lot of work cut out for you then. Yeah, yeah. No, unfortunately yeah. that'll be a never ending job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're in London now, I think. Were you born and raised there? I've managed to travel about eight stops down the Northern Line. So I was born <laughs> North London, grew up in a nice middle class family mainly uneventful and happy and undramatic did you go out to a boarding school in Hertfordshire my education was a bit of a was a bit of a mess but got saved in the latter part so I was in the local state system until I was 
11 or 12. And I think I was in that system more because my parents had a philosophical view about education should be inclusive than anything else, really. I'd actually say my initial version of it was most of my parents' <laughs> friends' kids were in the fee paying. I was in the state system, but, uh, but when I went to secondary school, I uh, went to a school that really was in quite dire straits, actually, really struggling. And, and, and I struggled a bit at school in that environment. And so uh, eventually my parents did take me out and I had a couple of kind of awkward transitions. And then ultimately they did send me to a, a fee paying school, which uh, involved quite a lot of catch up and ultimately came good. Actually, interestingly, I have subsequently recently discovered that I'm dyslexic, which I look back at my early schooling and my late start on achievement in an educational environment. And I wonder actually whether that was part of that journey as well. I ended up at not a high profile or aspirational fee paying school, but nonetheless at a school that allowed me to salvage and get back on track and accelerate my success as I reached A levels and then went on to university. I think it's really important that, I mean, I, I absolutely recognise the fact that I went through what a lot of other people go through, which was an unstable and unhappy period in my education. But I had the safety net of parents who perhaps hadn't, would, certainly wouldn't have been their preference either socially or financially to send me to a fee paying school, but they did have that option to, to use that to my advantage and it, and, it, and it worked out well and it doesn't escape me that everything that's been achieved since would have played out totally different if I hadn't have been lucky enough to be uh, part of a family that could employ that resource um, as and when needed. And I think certainly COVID is, um, and what's happened to many, many children who were far more talented than I ever was or would have been dealt a bad hand by what's happened to their education by this crisis. So then I think after that, you were off to Manchester for university studies mm -hmm. and a management science degree. So yeah, exactly. Like a broad business degree. I think it was actually called management science because it was at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. So it was at UMIST. It was actually a standalone university at that time, but it was mainly a science and engineering university. So I think there were lots of management degrees around and some of them were Bachelor of Arts and some of them are Bachelor of Sciences and I think they definitely approached it from a social science perspective. But yeah, it was essentially accounting, finance, the usual kind of mix of subjects. Then you went on and I think it's relevant to what you're doing later. You had a number of years at top tier firms, at least top tier at the time. <laughs> you know, Goldman Sachs, uh, you did something in their treasury department. So at Goldman, I kind of got into the city by accident and it was via Goldman. So I was hell bent on being an accountant. I think mainly because my grandmother told me it was something to fall back on in the future if things went wrong. But I think actually the closer I got to becoming an accountant and the reality of being one of 300 people on a very fixed regimented training program and the stories of how tedious learning to be an auditor was, I think it just started to ask myself increasingly, like, why am I doing this? And then somewhat by accident, completely by accident, I ended up at Goldman Sachs kind of milk round you know, graduate recruitment event where I, I met uh, a guy in the back office who was looking for a management trainee and we really hit it off and uh, I ended up being offered a job to go and be his his kind of management trainee and to me that felt like a great way of avoiding being on a training program and being within that kind of rigid system. So I went to Goldman but unfortunately I did well enough there that they put me on a training program anyway. Among other things, unwisely took a bunch of youngsters who were really enthusiastic about working in the back office and uh, told them to spend a week on the trading floor, which broadly uh, suicidal for their training program because every single one of us then said, hold on, we are here. This, this thing, is... do, do I want to be eating sandwiches at my desk in the back? Or... Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it's funny you should mention sandwiches at the desk because the thing actually, and this is amazing how shallow I was at 21, that the thing that I was most excited about was that Goldman traders got to write down on a piece of paper what they wanted for lunch and someone brought them lunch on a tray. And, yeah. uh, and that for me, that was, I thought, who wouldn't want that job? Someone bringing me food. <laughs> so um, that was part of my motivation. But then I saw, I realized quite quickly that actually there was something for me that a trading floor offered me something that I hadn't really had as a kid. It was to be part of this kind of loud, loud, admired crowd and I think actually that it did just appeal to me to be yeah. you know, be part of that and and so actually that's when I found a very strange recruit little small recruitment consultancy that specialized in trying to get people from the back office jobs on the trading floors 
and by yeah. some miracle, and I don't really understand how it happened or why it happened, or in fact, you know, it certainly doesn't happen anymore. They managed to get me a job at Lehman Brothers as a training assistant. So that's when you jumped there? Yeah, and that's when I went to Lehman, which, as you say, at the time was a firm of some repute. And that was bond trading, right? Yeah, that was, and that's how I, I became a Eurobond trader there. And then I did basically the same thing. I trade corporate bonds denominated in US dollars, really, from there all the way through to being Green Team, which I said was a small credit hedge fund. And then from there on, I started to broaden slightly and became a, a prop trader and ended up running Merrill Lynch's prop business in Europe. We closed it down in 2011 after the financial crisis. So for me, when Merrill shut, I had a had that sneaky suspicion that was my last job. We, a few of us, we did, you know, um, there were some potential job opportunities here or there, but I was increasingly thinking that I wasn't going to go. And then this opportunity came up to go to Pachuao with a bunch of people that I work with. And I think that uh, probably honestly, against my better judgment, I went uh, and took a group of people there, but really from the outset, I realized it wasn't for me and didn't really feel at home and wasn't really enjoying it. And actually, that definitely affected my ability to perform and the whole thing wasn't working and so very quickly into it i told them look this isn't going to work and we came to an agreement that i would just you know hang it up and move on and then it was clear to me at that point if it hadn't been before that it was time to do something completely different that brings us to around 2012 when you co-founded social sustainable capital yeah exactly information right yeah so how do you get from this career that you had into founding a company by the name of Social and Sustainable Capital? I never had a plan to go into banking. I, I actually, I think at the point I met Goldman Sachs at that recruitment, whatever it was, afternoon, I don't think I'd ever heard of Goldman Sachs before. So I don't <laughs> think it wasn't, it wasn't on my radar at all, which is probably quite strange given that my father ran a business that wrote software for banks, but I don't think he'd ever really exposed me to what goes on in the world of banking and I don't think I was interested in it. I think I was, if anything, I was probably, for most of my youth, I was probably thought I would be an engineer or something a bit more creative, but I just, I think I, I just drifted into a business degree because I think as I became a teenager, I think I just got quite focused on the idea of personal financial sustainability, that I wanted inde financial independence. And I think yeah. that, I, that took me down that route. So I, I think I didn't have a passion for being a trader. I had a passion for financial independence. And I deduced that the best way to get that was by being a trader. Plus, I found the environment was appealing because I think, I, as, as I mentioned, I think I probably was drawn to a kind of environment I hadn't really experienced before. And I certainly, I would say, you know, for the first eight years of my career were a drilling and induced excitement at the responsibility and the ludicrousness of the whole arrangement and, and I liked and I liked the, I enjoyed the process of being a trader I never engaged with the underlying things we were trading I was trading I was never particularly interested in the underlying companies or what they did and I did definitely have a negative reaction to the greed element of it all so excusing my own personal greed around financial independence I I, I found it I found taken to the extreme of the wealth, the desire for wealth that there was around me, which increased ludicrously over the period I was in the city. I found that increasingly distasteful as time went on. So when, when I joined Lehman in 93, what was considered to be great pay for someone doing the job I did, 10 years later, around the time of the burst of the dot-com bubble, was considered like a pittance. It was hysterical how <laughs> people just kept adding zeros to what was an acceptable pay packet. And yeah. I think that, that I, I, I found that really didn't work for me. And I think partly because I think maybe the thing that was always there was this, I've got no issue with people, some people earning more than others, but there is an overriding sense of fairness, which I felt was an issue. And, and my wife at the time was teaching in an East End of London school, very challenging school environment. And I saw how hard they all worked and what they were getting paid. And it got to the point where the differentiations were just, they always were crazy, but they got ludicrous. And I think I just increasingly got frustrated and, and embarrassed about that state of affairs. So yeah. I think as, as time went on and I did better and better and I reached, which I'm very grateful for, I did reach financial independence of one sort. Everyone's got a different view of what that is, but in my head, I reached what I thought was financial independence. Mm. As I got to that level, I, the, my tolerance for the things I found distasteful just diminished quite rapidly actually.
you know, five years of my time in the city, I actually found it just really challenging to get up and go in every day because I just found the prevailing attitude and the language and the approach and the view of the world that people who were focused almost uniquely on personal wealth was just, I just found it really challenging. If I had to summarize, you finally decided the bag was full enough and the environment was distasteful to your value. Yeah, no, right? It's actually more, it is that, it's that. And it's also a sense that I did used to constantly think to myself, I'm smart and capable. Surely there's something I can do that's better than this. I think that was actually became much more about that is I just got a bit embarrassed about what I was doing. I think it probably also yeah. has to do with having young kids who were desperately trying to understand what their dad did. And I just couldn't really... I couldn't really explain it to them. That gets easier as they, as they get older. <laughs> yeah. well, so as long cool. as you can give them the money, it gets easier. Yeah, no, exactly. But yeah, that, I think that's really, for me, that's, you know, and that is, this is by no means, none of that is a value judgment on what people, you know, I've got no issue with other people not feeling that way. It's just, you know, yeah. for me, for me, that yeah. was a challenge. Maybe you could just give me a high level overview of this company you, you co-founded, Social and Sustainable Capital. What it is you're doing, your mission? Yeah, so, we, so we're nothing like those people you talked about. Uh, those organizations you talked about, you're right. So there, there's a spectrum of capital where at one end you have red-blooded investment activity that's trying to maximize the financial return. And then as you move away down that spectrum, you have ESG investing and some of that good stuff, which is really important and really, uh, and, and large sums of money and helping to make big sums of money move the needle a small amount, which is really important. And then if you just keep going down that line, you keep going and you keep going and you keep going, eventually you get to us. The best way of thinking about us, so we are what you would call a private credit fund, maybe what used to be called a venture debt fund, where we are working with small, well, we call them small to medium-sized organisations, but the, the, only because in our universe they're small to medium, but actually in any kind of international sense, they're micro. They're revenues of somewhere between a zero and revenues between them, half a million pounds a year and maybe 150 million pounds a year. So they're, they're, they're very small businesses on, on any kind of global scale. We are lending money to these small and medium-sized businesses that either are taking investment for the first time or investment is a small part of what they do and where making a profit is a hygiene factor for them but not something that drives what they do well, what does that mean yeah yeah so they need to make money to continue to exist and certainly the ability to generate a surplus year on year is really important to them to protect their business models, but as charities and as organizations are working with vulnerable people, they're not doing what they do to satisfy shareholders. They're completely focused on their client group and their client group of vulnerable people who need their assistance to live fulfilling lives. Your views initially in your description, you used the word businesses, and then now you just started to use the word charities this is one of the misconceptions so a charity ultimately a charity is a legal form the charity also describes what people do but it's a legal form so i think when we talk to people and we talk about well, say we provide finance to charities they think that we're providing financing to organizations that, that raise grants and donations and essentially on give that money or provide programs it, that yeah. isn't Kind of charities we're working with we we don't work with charities that are supported by exclusively by grants and donations that might be a part of what they do but these are not-for-profit businesses so these are organizations that are delivering services to local or central government so they're, they're they're businesses that deliver contracts working with vulnerable people they get paid for that service and uh, they may supplement to some extent with grants and donations but when we're making investments our investments are based on their ability to use capital to unlock revenue streams that can repay repay them in most situations or in all situations they're retained by the government yeah for us for one of the things that SAS focuses on is practically everybody we work with is delivering services to local or central government just to make it real give me an example of what one of these entities that you lend to actually does and why they need credit and what what they're doing a whole range of stuff they they may be helping victims of domestic violence they may be working with people who have been released from prison 
They may be uh, working with children leaving the care system who have been in the foster care system. They may be taking care of adults with learning disabilities. In almost all cases, they're delivering some aspects of, of the statutory care that the government is required to form for vulnerable disadvantaged people. And so I guess if you scroll back far enough, all of this was delivered by government itself. And over the years, government has outsourced that work to people who know better or can deliver it more cheaply or whatever it might be. And why they need the money is because just like any corporate, if you're going to, if you win a new contract to deliver a new service, there's a cost of, of building the ability to deliver that. I mean, this is in the most simple case and someone has to upfront the cost of that. And then once the service is up and running and you start to receive payment for delivering the service, you can then pay down that initial investment. So essentially, what it all comes back to is we're providing capital that puts these not-for-profit businesses into a position where they can deliver a contract and generate a revenue stream. Now, this is where it goes back to what I said before. That revenue stream is necessary to create a viable, ongoing, sustainable business, but they're not in almost all cases, although they have one eagle eye on the revenue stream to make sure it covers the costs and generates enough of a surplus to have a healthy business, they're not profit maximizing organizations. Who are the owners of these businesses? So they're, they're charities, so no one owns them, which is another big issue is they have no share capital. So okay. as, as charities, they, there's, no private, there's no private shareholders. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't private companies with shareholders operating in the same space. Yeah. And certainly in social care in the UK, there's an enormous presence of for-profit businesses and private equity. And that makes it quite challenging in some respects for the organisations we work with, as there's plenty of capital available for the very, very profitable contracts that are on offer. And so our organisations tend to mop up the very difficult to deliver um, low margin business that commercial money doesn't always want to. But, but yeah, it is a mixed economy of profit and not for profit. Is this kind of blended finance or? Yes, yeah, so there's areas where that's a really obvious question and answer. And the answer is absolutely yes. So there's some areas of activity where in social investment, the only organizations that either have a high tolerance for risk or, as you said, prepared to make it less of a financial term. Because I think the argument really goes, all impact investment provides a blend of financial and impact return. So I think, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the non-answer is on an overall, if these things are fungible, but on an overall return basis, you know, our, these investments are really compelling. The financial return element might be lower, but you're getting, you know, huge impact return. The truth is, yes, of course, to the harder and harder and the riskier and riskier this stuff becomes, somebody, and there are lots of organisations in the UK, trusts and foundations, charitable trusts and foundations, to name a few, that are prepared to take what other people would consider as a below market financial return to, to be able to deliver these outcomes. So I think there are some areas where that's really obvious, where you're asking people to take a very high level of risk and probably a, a protected capital, very low single digit type return. And then yeah. there's the bit in the middle where our housing fund is, where actually we meet charitable investors that consider the return to be more fitting of a more social kind of market. But we also have commercial investors in our fund who consider our returns to be entirely commercial. And that's yeah. because what the right return is not, you can't really, you can't really look at it in isolation. It's a function of the risk, function of where it fits in your portfolio and what you're trying to achieve. So it's, it, so the area that we're in with our housing fund is it's really hard to answer that question because people have got a very different view about what a product working in social housing that yields, has a target yield of 6%, whether that is where that sits on the spectrum of commercial and non-commercial return. We, we would argue that actually that is a, a, a commercial return and, and lots of commercial investors agree with us. Others would say that unless you're making 12% a year, it's not commercial. Do you benchmark against something? We benchmark our fund against other organizations that are both social in their mission and not social in their mission or not as overtly social in their mission as we are because everyone at the moment is claiming to be impactful in one respect or another. And I think the returns are in line with what you would expect for an unlevered social housing fund and look there's no that's why our fund is growing and that's why we're attracting the kind of money that we are yeah. because ultimately there's no doubt about it that in order to be able to operate at any kind of scale you do have to be able to offer a return and a risk profile that looks palatable and ultimately justifiable to investment committees and boards and 
directors who have to ultimately sign off on that investment. Is that a published benchmark or is this uh, something that you develop? Yeah, there benchmark? are a number of organizations of different motivation and slightly different structure operating in the same space. And, and broadly speaking, an unscientific approach is that they are promising somewhere between kind of a five and eight percent return on an unlevered basis. Is this open fund or closed end fund? Yeah, so they're closed end funds. <laughs> they're similar in structure to venturing or private equity funds. Our fund is a 13 year fund with a three year investment period of which for two and a half years it's open for investment. We're in the process of having the final close for our first fund, which has gone extremely successfully. There was some anxiety around when COVID started, but actually ultimately the combination of the UK government's focus on housing as a result of COVID and investors changing attitude towards impact has actually been really positive for us. And so we're in the process of putting together the initial stages of the launch of Fund 2, which will be later in the year. Socially sustainable capital focused on investing in these charities and social enterprises. I guess there's two aspects to it. There's the impact element. Is that the best way to have an impact? And secondly, the financial return piece, I guess most people would assume that lending to charities is a dreadful idea. The initial idea that you could help socially driven organizations to grow and help more people was extremely appealing. But as you said, it was, you scratched your head and said, well, hey, say, well, how can you make a fair risk adjusted return doing that? The next level of our work back in 2012 and 2013 was then to take a bit of a harder look at the sector and work out actually how risky is this? And our yeah. feeling was actually it's not that risky if you do it properly because often you've got government income streams. This is one kind of what I always felt coming from, as you noted on my CV, some organisations that at the time were considered to be great. But guess what? Lehman, UBS, well, Lehman did go bust. UBS and Merrill came very close on at least one, UBS on more than one occasion, Merrill on, <laughs> on one. It, this, I, I constantly heard from people that worked in kind of mainstream finance about how the charitable sector was so poorly run and finally they could be more like commercial businesses. And that did make me somewhat scratch my head of having been at the epicenter of total and utter failure of control and uh, logic working at some of these big banks. So it did make, I was always curious as to why people thought charities that existed on tiny margins and tiny revenues were considered bad businesses when, you know, businesses that earned billions could fail. And uh, I think our initial work prior to setting up SAS, and I have to say, I think it's been confirmed for me, is that these are some of the best run businesses I've ever met. They're not trying to do the same thing that a commercial business is trying to do. And that's the problem. If you judge a not-for-profit business or a charity in the same way as you judge a for-profit business, of course, it doesn't look like it's as well run because you're assuming that both are trying to achieve the same thing. A charity yeah. is not trying to achieve profit maximization. And when you start to understand that and start to understand the headwinds that they're constantly facing, you realize that these are actually really well run businesses. Not all of them, but enough of them such that they're backable and they can be encouraged to replicate or reach some kind of scale. But why don't we drill down on the social housing fund, maybe give an overview of that fund and, and the impact that you're targeting to achieve with that? So this is very specific and easy to understand, I think, if I can explain it. Working with vulnerable people in the UK involves two things, typically. It involves providing them with the advice and support that they need to overcome an issue that they're facing. Maybe that they've left a violent partner, that they've come out of the foster system, they've come out of jail, they're living with a, a learning disability, whatever it might be. So part of the um, role of these organisations is to provide the support that's needed to help them overcome that. But another part of it is to ensure that they're living somewhere suitable and safe. Charities have been trying to deliver this dual kind of outcome but they've had one hand slightly tied behind their back because they've been relying on external parties for the housing element. So they may be relying on the council or housing associations or private rental sector to ensure that there are suitable properties available for their um, clients that would hopefully help their recovery or their transition or their life in, or their ongoing situation, but certainly not hurt the uh, chances of developing a stable living situation. And, and what became clear to us as we were involved in this space was actually more often than not, housing options were really poor. They are either well-meaning but not suitable at one end of the spectrum, all the way down to unsuitable and frankly, slightly scandalous in terms of the condition of some properties that existed in the private rental sector. Now, 
that's disappointing, but not completely surprising, because there's no reason why the private rental sector in the UK, where the average number of properties owned by um, a private sector landlord is one, why that would be a, a body that would be could be relied upon for housing disadvantaged and vulnerable people. The market, for whatever reason, and there's a whole separate discussion about the housing market in the UK, has evolved to quite an unsatisfactory place. But what we were faced with was a situation where these charities that could do a great job with people were underperforming because they just could not access appropriate housing. And we, in our travels in trying to understand how we were going to make a positive impact on the world, discovered a group of charities that had taken their fate into their own hands and found ways to become their own landlord and either rent or buy properties and take control of housing stock and use those houses that they controlled and owned or controlled and leased to ensure that the interventions they were delivering were located in the appropriate living accommodation. And what we saw was the in, just huge change in the, the level of outcomes that organisations that had access to those properties were able to achieve. And so we looked at the space and said, we need to have a fund that allows residential property to transfer from the commercial profit maximisation space into the charitable space so that it can be offered to clients alongside the support services that charities offer. So we were focused on providing that finance. Now, so that's philosophically what we're doing, practically what we're doing. If you're a charity, you probably can get a mortgage and some of them do have mortgages. But because of the risk averse nature of charities, we found that there was a limit to how far they were prepared to extend themselves to purchase this housing and to build these property portfolios. Mm. And what we understood over time was that the reason that was the case was because of the nature of a mortgage. And there were some certain factors about mortgages that they found off putting. The requirement to come up with a deposit, the fact that they were exposed to house prices, the fact that they were exposed to voids and to government payments, and the fact that they could never really be sure because of the fixed nature of mortgages that they'd be able to cover the ongoing cost of these houses. So what we realised, given our experience of working with charities, was two things. One, that if we could find a way to share some of those risks or to pass some of those risks from the uh, charities onto the investor base, that would enable them to consider taking on investment. And number two, because of the work we do with investor base, the investor base, and because we have been investors ourselves, we realised that the risks that the charities wanted to rid themselves of were actually things that in a great many cases, investors were not going to be worried about. And in fact, actually, in some cases, we're actually positively trying to seek i.e. exposure to government inflation assets that uh, increase in value with inflation. And we spotted an opportunity to create a very simple structure that de-risked the proposition for the borrower and increased the, prop the risk proposition for the investor but that would still allow the capital to flow. So how does it work? I understood you have a, kind of a unique mortgage instrument or product or structure that you use. So it's a, it essentially looks like a mortgage in terms of the legal documentation, but the couple of things that are unique about it are that we provide 100% of the funding to buy the houses, that we have a charge over the houses that are purchased with the money we provide, but not over the wider activities of the organisation, that our return our interest is performance based so we don't have a fixed level of interest we look at the rental income of the property portfolio deduct agreed costs with the charity and then we receive the balance so every quarter it's a different amount based on the performance of the portfolio of the charity and of the, the houses themselves and then the final significant difference is at the end of 10 years, what the charity owes us is a percentage of the value of the properties in the future as opposed to a fixed amount. So if they borrow a million pounds from us in 10 years time, what they owe us back is 85% of the value of the properties, regardless of whether that's more or less than what they borrowed from us. Yeah. So they operate the houses for 10 years and they're guaranteed an equity position in the properties at the end of the 10 years. And at that point, they can use that equity to then go and get a commercial mortgage and buy the properties. What is the equity position they end up with? So they end up with a 15% stake in the portfolio, regardless of the valuation of the portfolio. If they buy a million pounds of houses and in 10 years time, those houses are still worth a million pounds, they only have to pay us back 850,000 pounds. So they basically earn their way into an equity position in the housing. Now, obviously our assumption is, and it's with UK property, it's proven to be the case. The worst performing 10 years in history is an increase of 1.4% a year. So if the mass is right, in 10 years time, these houses will be worth more than they were paid for them. And so the discount 
gets the fund back slightly more than, than was lent at the beginning of the life of the transaction. And the fund overall says on average across the UK, we're going to see a continuation of steadily rising house prices so that on a fund level, the money we get paid back at the end will be more than we lent at the beginning. But what it does do for the individual charities in each little geography and each individual transaction, they are insulated from being in a negative equity situation, which is what they're really worried about. But how do you actually select an investment and make your investment decision? We're looking for a couple of really key things, actually. I think the first is we're looking for organisations of a certain size. So we're typically looking for organisations with revenue of between one and 30 million pounds, because this is from an impact perspective where we think our money can create the most social impact. We, like any investor, we look for really high performing management teams and really great boards. That's really critical to making social investments. We look for organizations that have experience of managing. So we understand they're on a journey and we're part of that journey, but we need to be able to see a track record of how an organization manages housing stock, um, because that's the bet that we're taking really. We really importantly need to understand that they're a partner to their local commissioners, i.e. local government, we reference check with ultimately the organisation that's going to be the purchaser of their service. And we really need to understand that there's a close trusting relationship between them and, and that local commissioner. And we need to really make ourselves comfortable that actually the provision of housing is going to generate better social outcomes for people. So yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. just evidencing that, that impact. All right. So then can you give me like one real world example of the type of impact and financial result? That yeah, yeah. So I, 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 mean, I can tell you, the, the organization, the, the interesting thing about this product is we didn't sit in a room with a whiteboard and a bunch of really smart finance people and come up with it. this structure was genuinely co-designed with a charity who, without whom we wouldn't have landed on the structure. And that organization is called Hull Women's Network. They're in Hull in, in the Northeast of England. And we met them quite early on in our journey and their story was really clear. So they, at the time we met them, they had 99 properties that they managed in the Hull area. They helped women and their children fleeing domestic violence. The statistic they quoted was that women on average flee a violent perpetrator on seven occasions and return before they finally break through. What they could demonstrate was that by providing an appropriate safe house, women left on the first occasion and never returned to the violent perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So you basically, I think we don't need to describe that social impact any more than that. Pretty evident. We were completely blown away by that. that just providing the right kind of housing meant that women and children could avoid six return visits to a violent perpetrator who may actually ultimately kill. And so we said, that's great. Why don't you have more housing? And they said, because we don't have the financial risk appetite to take on more because ultimately our goal is to stay in business. And if we take on a lot more housing using conventional structures, we run the risk of not being around at all. So we accept a much slower rate of growth because we must endure, we must always be here. And we that's how we got into the discussion with them about there must be a product that would make it possible for you to grow. They had 300 women on the waiting list that were trying to flee violent partners. There wasn't a way of growing their portfolio such that they could help those women. Since that time we met that organisation in 2017, with our funding, they have bought somewhere between 80 and 100 houses, which they now help yeah. women flee domestic abuse on a regular basis. And, and, and the, uh, there's a never ending list of stories of women and children who have been able to rebuild their lives after sometimes many years of, of misery and pain. What's the total AUM in, in your housing fund? So this fund uh, is at 75 million, the first one. Yeah. Okay. Which is, you know, which actually, to be honest, not only is that extremely large in the social investment world, Actually, if you look at the comparable world for us, which is small private venture debt part of the market, is actually in line with a lot of commercial funds as well. It's not out of place to a green bond fund or to a big listed equity fund that isn't large, but it isn't out of place. There are plenty of asset managers in the UK doing fully commercial business with funds in that zip code. We, our next fund in the housing space is going to be 150 to 200. So for us as an organization, we are short-term goal of 250 AUM, medium-term goal of 500. What would you say the benefits are to your investors? This is really the real trick with impact investment is that the benefits to investors have always been the same. It's the ability to make a fair return doing something you can be proud of. But the truth is three, five years ago, 
there were lots of people who believed that was the right thing to do, but there were a small group of people who felt they actually could do that, whether it's because of their mandate or because of the fiduciary responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. They, there was only a small group of people who felt that they could say, this is the right way to make an appropriate return, so we're going to do it. What's changed over the last two to three years beyond recognition is that not only do people recognise the importance of putting some of their money to work in something that generates something other than the pure financial return. Actually, I'd say that many investing bodies are actually nervous about not being able to say what it is in their portfolio that is doing that. So we right, are finding right. that people are either pushing themselves to understand what is available in the world of impact investment at our end of the spectrum, or in some cases, their stakeholders are pushing them quite hard towards us. Well, I can tell you there are asset managers in the UK that manage the large sums of money that sit in charitable endowments, where the charitable endowments are saying to the asset managers, what exactly are you doing with your AUM that is socially impactful? And some of those asset managers may be losing mandates because they can't describe what it is that they do that's impactful. When you lose a mandate, you can put a very clear number on what it just cost you to not be doing something more impactful. And that is definitely helping organisations consider the best way for them to do impact investment in the UK. So I would say that if you look at the journey of SAS for many years, there was an absolute bar that we as an organisation needed to get over to be able to attract commercial money. And that absolute bar was too high because of the yeah, nature yeah. of what we did. What's happened now is that's rather become a relative bar. Organisations are saying we need to do something in the impact social investment space. What's the best fund available? So we've yeah, gone from yeah. having to reach some artificially high bar to now just having to be the best product on offer. And not everybody agrees, but there's enough people that believe that our product is the best thing on offer. And as a result, we're engaging a far broader range of investors than we would have thought possible. You've described all the benefits to investors. Primarily, the revenue seems to be coming ultimately from the government. Yep. You've described the impact that nobody could argue with and everyone would want to be part of. And you're benchmarking somewhere in the high uh, single digits, 5 to 8%. So this sounds like an investor win-win wonderland. Is there any downside to this? The downside is we're a small asset manager that started running around in 2014. Ultimately, for some people, it's a challenging area because we're funding organisations that are working with vulnerable people. The funds are very long dated and they're completely liquid. You invest in 2021 and you don't get your money back to 2032 and there's no liquidity. I think actually people would have said the risk profile of housing benefit, this is pre-COVID, they would have said, oh, the risk profile of housing benefit is tricky because governments cut spending, et cetera, et cetera, through COVID. It's the only area of the property market that you have not been absolutely, you know, crushed in because if you're investing in housing or in, uh, in commercial property or uh, hotels or shopping centres, obviously you've had a torrid time. There seems to be some kind of a natural tension between delivering a financial return to investors on one side and then you're deploying capital to companies that have real yep. urgent human needs. Yep. Is that something that you have to manage in a certain way? Or? Yeah, and that's, that's the secret source, if there is a secret source for SASC and any other organisation in this space is being credible to both sides of this problem. Right? So yeah. we, I think somewhat uniquely, have two stakeholder groups that are very different. Right? So if you're in, if you're a venture capital business, you're talking to investors and founders who are both trying to make a lot of money and everyone's on the same page and it's really straightforward. We as an organisation have to be able to engage with organisations that are motivated almost entirely by purpose and in some cases may even find profit quite a challenging concept. And on the other side, we're working with investors who are increasingly interested in purpose, but ultimately when it comes down to it, it's there's, a, there's an underlying financial incentive and it's that's tricky and it's, it's quite a hard place to live in that gray area of impact and between purpose and profit and i think that's what we do well it's constantly reassessing the construction of the product how we market who we market to who we engage with who we work with it's hard it's sometimes we say who knew how hard it was going to be to try and do a little bit of good we aren't delivering the social outcomes we're supporting organizations that are doing the hard work 
to be clear, we're in a we're in a supporting role. We don't claim the impact of the organisations that we provide finance for. But it's been surprisingly hard to create a sustainable asset manager in this space because yeah. it isn't something that left to its own devices capitalism probably would have found. As you say, it's an interesting clash of cultures. You originally were funded by charities or charitable organisations who probably weren't interested as much in a commercial return, but it sounded like you're getting more perhaps pension funds or other organizations that clearly have a fiduciary responsibility, but maybe because now they have to report on the impact that their investment activities are having, are interested perhaps in you, but at the same time, they have a fiduciary responsibility on return on, on the assets that they're managing. Has this changed by a, a big percentage for you? Two, three years ago, it was hard to see. We've been going for four or five years and it wasn't clear how we were ever going to make the change away from that small group of highly motivated investors that would allow us to do what we were doing, but ultimately could never provide the scale of capital that would allow us to do things in a, you know, in a meaningful way. And then it just all, it all changed when the world, the fight investing world discovered impact. And whereas, as you say, ultimately, the truth is three years ago, it was very hard to speak to an organization with a billion pound fund and persuade them to part with five million pounds into something like us. Now, the argument is I've got a billion pounds. It's just a five million pound investment. And it's really what we need to, to satisfy people that we're thinking about the, the way we invest. The whole argument has been turned on its head. It's gone from being too small to be relevant to very relevant and helpful that ultimately it's a small percentage of people's financial exposure. It's been a sea change. I think initially we thought it was a threat because we thought, I think there still is this risk. If people don't understand the difference between green bonds and what we do, organizations may have a small portfolio of green bonds and say, that's it, that's my impact investment done. But actually, I think that initial fear has gone away because I think actually people really do recognize the difference between an organization issuing a green bond and providing capital to an organization that helps women flee violence. I think people do understand that. And it may yeah. be that the investor understands it, but says, I understand the difference, but I cannot do what you're doing for reasons X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But that is still positive. What do you know now about social investing that you wish you knew in 2012 when you founded the Social and Sustainable Capital? That that success would come from more listening rather than more talking. <laughs> yeah, I think that's broader than that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then if someone wants to get into the social impact investing space, how would you advise them to get in the business? Where, where should they cut their teeth? Yeah, we're involved with hiring younger people at the moment. I still, at this stage, just because of the immaturity of the business, I still think it's helpful for young people to have cut their teeth for a number of years in a more conventional finance setting, because ultimately social investment isn't at the stage where it can offer graduates the level of training that they might get elsewhere. Yeah. So I, I, I still think it's probably, I'm slightly reticent in advising people to go straight from the undergrad degree into social investment, not because it's not an amazing experience and they won't work, they'll work with brilliant people. But we're not in a position to throw money at a training program in the way that a large organization might be. And there's some of those basics will come in really handy in your career. And it's, yeah. so I, I think, I think it's, it's counterintuitive, but I still think at this, some kind of mainstream financial education, you can almost consider it as like an extension of your formal education, just to almost work in the mainstream world to get exposure to the stuff that will be helpful for you later at, at this yeah. stage. Is still probably the right way to go. One last question. If you could sit down and speak with anyone in the responsible investment space and pick their brain, who would you love to sit down with? Yeah, I, I mean, I think broadly, I find people like me deeply disinterested. I don't know. I, I think the great, the, great, the great pleasure of my job is that I don't ever really have to sit down with people like me. But the people I love sitting down with are the people that run these charities and operate these services. Um, yeah. And I'm just never cease to be amazed with how impressed I am with people who have pursued a life based on the desire to do the right thing and give something back. I do find in general people are like, oh, you're so amazing. You walked away from a city career to do this. So frankly, I, th I think that's a joke. I walked away from a city career after I'd made enough money that, it, that I could 
do that in a, a way that was relatively devoid of fear about my own personal kind of path. Yeah. The people yeah. that leave school and university and dedicate their lives to taking care of vulnerable people. And that, those are the people I like sitting down with. It's, it just never ceases to impress me that people's motivations are what they are. And, and thank and thank God for people like So before we leave, I have to ask you, I, I think I spy... It could be a Marshall guitar amp uh, sitting yeah, behind that's you. Marshall, it's uh, no, it's not. I've got a line six and a fisherman amp. It sounds. I, I really, actually, I don't like the output out of that at all. But that was one of the things when I left the city. One of my big dreams was to be in a band, and no one was ever going to ask me to be in a band. So I actually started a band when I left the city. Unbelievably, I, I started it for my 40th. The we were a covers band. We inflicted our music onto kind of 120 of my closest friends and family thinking that was going to be a one-off shot. But unbelievably, we've been on a maybe on a once a year basis, engaged by friends and family to do birthdays and whatever it might be and school events. So the band still rumbles on. What's the genre? Oh, it's actually kind of quite eclectic. It's, it's, it's kind of anything from 60s, three chord 60s, all the way through to 80s pop and uh, kind of bizarre covers of... Uh, highly produced tracks that you hear on the radio. It's, it's good fun. What's the name of the band? Well, so, so one of my <laughs> colleagues in the band uh, called it Off the Richter Scale. <laughs> uh, um, it was between that, I think the other choices were 40 Ricks based on the Rolling Stones and there was a couple of others as well, but yeah, that's the one we went for. Do you play? You must play. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, this part of my life is completely unrelated to how I earn money. But in my case, I play 80s metal. And, oh, uh, wow. Oh, and, wow. And, okay. it's, so and it's, so it's very socially irresponsible music <laughs> yeah. making. Yeah. Isn't that the most thing that's the most fun about it? I struggled with it for years because there's almost nobody that I know that I ran into professionally. It just was something that nobody seemed to know about or cared about. And yeah, and on the surface of it, you look at it and it's, yeah, it's totally devoid of values it was the true sex drugs and and heavy metal if you like to play there's nothing that can take the place of that feeling when you're on stage and it, when it comes together when it sounds bad there's nothing worse than that but when everything's hitting on all cylinders actually the sense of bonding that comes from being in a band and making music with other people is something that's probably missing in modern day life is that there's a reason before TVs and radios that families and communities would get together and play. It's, I, I think it, it it's such a positive feeling to rehearse and to play with people. And actually, I think the sad thing about music is that these days, because there's all these other things to do, unless you're a really good musician, it feels like there's no part for you in the business of yeah. making music. Well, if you go back to hundreds, it, everyone it, in the family played something, didn't matter how good they were, they just everyone joined in. I think Bruce Springsteen said that the music business is basically a, a, a business for misfits. <laughs> 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 Interesting. I'd love to hear off the Richter scale. That's the off name. The yeah, that's the name. <laughs> What's yours called? Metal Justice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it still plays actually, but it's pretty yeah socially irresponsible. I would say. <laughs> Everyone's got to have it out. <laughs> Very good. Listen, Ben, it's been great meeting you. I've really enjoyed it. I think it's an amazing thing that you're Thank doing. You. And I think this will be very interesting for other people to learn about what you're doing because I think you're only doing it in the UK. But this is the same need exists everywhere and a lot of places even worse than. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So right. good luck to you and I'll be in touch with you. I huh? appreciate you taking the time. Huh? No problem at all. Have a good weekend. Right. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do me a favor and hit the like button and subscribe to receive future episodes. You can find more interviews, articles, and information on sustainable and responsible investing at our website, SRI360.com. If you enjoyed this interview and you would like to read more lessons learned from world-class SRI investors, get yourself a copy of my book, Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees. It's a must read for anyone wanting to know more about investing for positive social, environmental, and ethical impact, all with market returns. These are the stories and tactics of those leading the way as sustainable and responsible investing goes mainstream. 
Sustainable and Responsible Investing 360 Degrees is now available in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook format wherever books are sold. 